Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cleaning for Air Quality. I'm Jennifer Goetz, the Editorial Director of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by ISSA. So before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. Our speakers are on video today, and if you would like to view them at the top of your screen, look for the bar in your window to pull down so they are visible to you. Uh, next, please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions via the question box at any time. There will be a Q&A portion after this presentation, so please type your questions in there to send them to us. If at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send us a message via that question section and someone on our team will answer you privately. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the control panel, so please be sure the panel is expanded so you can access the question box. And if you are interested in continuing education credits, please note that you receive a certificate of attendance and an email from facility executive after this webinar. You can report to your association for the credit. Also, I wanna bring to your attention in our handout sections, you can download this summer, the GBAC experience, defining and measuring clean for indoor healthy spaces. Um, and now I will move on to introduce your speakers. Uh, John McEwen is a medical entrepreneur and currently the CEO of Allergy Standards LTD, an international standards and certification body he founded while working as an emergency room doctor. McEwen works with healthcare entrepreneurs, professional managers, business owners in life sciences, biotechnology, and medical device sectors to develop strategies to build profitable businesses, clarify their business models for scalable growth, and ultimately ultimately improve lives. Patty Ollinger is the executive director for the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, a division of ISSA, the world's leading trade association for the cleaning industry. GBAC is recognized for GBAC Star Facility and Service Provider Accreditation and as a leader in training, education, biorisk management, decontamination, and infection control disciplines. Uh, Mark Hernandez is a registered professional civil engineer and an expert on the characterization and control of bioaerosol both indoors and out. A generation of his research leverages modern forensic science for wide area aerosol surveillance and the design of novel disinfection systems for the built environment. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here with Facility Executive. Thank you for having us. Oh, of course. Now, okay, so to get started, um, John, would you mind taking the first question? <laughs> um, and everybody, we would love to hear your perspective, but you know, how has the cleaning industry evolved over the past 10 to 15 years, would you say? Uh, well, again, thank you for having me and, and putting on this, this uh, excellent uh, attendance at the webinar. I know it's very hard to get people to turn up these days, so very impressed with that. Um, I think the changes, have accelerated over the last couple of years, obviously, with that with that word that we hope is all very much in our in our rear view mirror. Um, and the big change for me is the professionalization of of cleaning, uh, facilities management, and people recognizing keeping our buildings healthy and safe is a frontline worker issue. And um, it's a skill set people should be trained in it, and how vital it is when you when you take that away. So just the acknowledgement and the professionalization of of the whole cleaning and facilities management industry and for me the big big takeaway after the pandemic is that we're now really scrutinizing cleaning for health and not just cleaning for appearance and we're seeing that with regards to say people not just adding fragrances you know very heavy fragrances and thinking something smells clean or it looks clean but is it actually clean in a healthy way um, uh, I think overuse of say some fragrances is sometimes masking uh, issues like mold and not getting to the source of the issues. So it's doubly worse when you don't clean well in with that mm -hmm. kind of health mindset and you're, you're covering up uh, unhygienic issues with, with fragrance and odors, but you're not actually getting to source control. So for me, that would be the, the big, the big uh, change is the professionalism, uh, the expectation, um, and also the the, the technology, I think we're gonna get onto a little bit on about sensor technology and smart and connected buildings. But for me, that's the big shift. It's a mind, mindset shift and a culture shift. Mm -hmm. Perfect, so Patty, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, you know, I mean, hygiene has been something that if we even go back further in history, you know, back at the early 1900s and even before then, we saw a big shift in people recognizing that hygiene paid a huge 
um, role in um, infection prevention and health. And you saw a giant shift even during that time with sanitation. We then saw a lot of innovation with um, antibiotics coming into play. We saw a lot of innovation with medicine. And we kind of, I, in some respects, kind of forgot about that hygiene. We took it for granted. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now, and especially with the pandemic that we've just all experienced, and some of the outbreaks that we've experienced in the last 10 to 15 years, is that hygiene pays a big um, you know, role in protecting people. And then in addition, when we start looking at indoor air quality, we realize that, you know, these are areas that we really, you know, I, I won't say that we didn't pay attention because in my previous role, I was in environmental health and safety, and we were always responding to, you know, indoor air quality concerns and, and, and what we were looking for is those things that we knew about, you know, is there a mold issue and, and you know, is there potentially, you know, outside um, exhaust from a truck coming into the building or something like that. The new monitoring systems that we're starting to see are starting to play a role in us defining that it's not just the particulates, but it's VOCs and CO2 levels. And as we've closed in buildings, is there a concern for that indoor, indoor environment that we're living in and working in on a daily basis? And I'm seeing that, um, as John indicated, we're moving away from let's just spritz uh, something to make it smell better and to look pretty and to be able to verify and validate that the spaces that we're living in and, and working in are actually healthy environments um, for us to be there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And Mark, do you have anything to add to this question on really what has changed over the past like 10 to 15 years, you'd say? Um, mo most of my experience is based in school, so I'm going to limit it to that. So lots of highly occupied rooms and um, after the kids leave, what happens? And um, so I would say right now, I, I agree with Patty that the two biggies are trust but verify. Okay, we've cleaned it. How do we verify it on large scale, right? And two, what are the effects um, in the occupied space on air quality, um, both for the people that do the cleaning and the students and faculty that later reoccupy the building? Um, and, and getting the verification of cleaning in closer to real time, as well as real time metrics of what the occupants breathe after cleaning has happened. So um, fragrances and, and uh, appearances, aesthetics aside, the, you know, what's what's the hard scientific um, measurements that we can do to assure cleaning was done, done well, done continuously with high quality, and then lastly, um, what's the exposure potential of the, of the occupants with that? Um, I would add to uh, now that we're talking about the lungs of the building as well, um, so cleaning the duct work, the um, the heat transfer equipment that actually conditioned the air is now part of it as well. So I see it moving um, to not only the occupied space, but uh, all the machinery, the HVAC system that actually moves fresh air in and, and stale air out, filters out and so on, cleaning that on some regular basis and looking at the efficacy of that. Mm -hmm. So those of are course. the three elements I've seen. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's very important. And just in this discussion about, you know, how things have changed, what are, um, when did the conversation about air quality really first involve um, cleaning products, would you say? Um, and then Patty, would you mind starting? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, wow. You know, I mean, I think it depends upon, you know, what you're look when, who you're talking to. I mean, if you're talking to individuals who are in the green building area, they have been concerned about, you know, what, what products are you bringing into the buildings and how is it affecting what we breathe? You know, if you're talking to the industrial hygienists out there in the world, it's, it's you know, as Mark had indicated, the people who are working with the, with the equipment, we're always looking at how, you know, how, are those chemistries and chemicals potentially affecting those individuals? I love the, the topic um, that Mark had talked about, lungs of the building and all the equipment in the HVAC system. There's a lot, and especially in these commercial buildings, there is a lot of moving parts. And sometimes mm -hmm. we forget about those moving parts. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to see is there is a, there's a lot more research going on in the chemistries that are being used and not only are they safe and effective and for humans, 
but also are they safe and effective for the buildings in the lungs of the building and how we can and look at it. So I think that if there's a silver lining with this pandemic, it really has shaken that tree and said, you know, let's take a look at all of these things that we're working with and how can we do better um, going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's that's perfect. It leads into my next question of, you know, really what were some of the biggest lessons that um, facility executives and facility managers really could take away from the pandemic? Um, you know, Mark, would you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah. It, it's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, like off the shelf right now, we can do real time monitoring and near real time monitoring. And it's not hard. It's not expensive. Mm -hmm. um, just to to give you an example, we just did an economic analysis of putting um, air purifiers and air quality monitors in classrooms, and it boils down to the cost of a textbook per kid per academic year. You know, who I, I think there was a myth that this is too expensive, this technology is too far off, mm -hmm. um, we can't do things in real time, and when you actually do it, and we did it during the pandemic off the shelf, off the shelf, what's it, what's it cost, um, you know, on a per student basis, if you give up a coffee a week, you can monitor. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it's, you know, the interpreting this data, getting the data itself, you know, even a professor can do it, right? I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's that easy. And so I, I, I hope that's the take home lesson um, that it's there, it's affordable, we should do this anyway. And the, the, the training for it's not steep, both on the air side as well as the fomite side. So that, that's what I learned. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it surprised the school superintendents, the facilities managers, and uh, those I were working with, I think we all thought this was expensive, that it was James Bond stuff, and it's not. Mm -hmm. John, do you have anything to add? I certainly underscore what, what Mark is saying. People have kind of lost their way in these kind of novel air cleaning technologies and very, whether it's photocatalytic or UV and it seems very complicated and very expensive. And I, I, I was at a conference that Mark presented his paper at and, and his interventions were, were very doable and as he mentioned there, not, not particularly expensive but just applied in a really strategic manner. So. Um, yeah, you know, what I what I would say about certainly for employees that if if we are going to convince people to come back to work and to to build these like schools or places of employment for really important things like innovation and culture and team building, you can do a lot remotely. We've, the 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 pandemic has shown that, but it also I think companies are, are beginning to realise it is important for some days core work days and everybody's wrestling with hybrid work policies and things. But if we are going to expect people to come back to our buildings we've got to be able to demonstrate to them that those buildings are safe and it's acceptable to come back they're being clean they're being clean for air quality and we're monitoring and we're measuring trusting and verifying and um, because we we've been at home for our homes been our restaurants our gyms our cinemas they've been everything for so long but we've got to get people back into offices for certain for certain aspects but we need to show and um, not only because it's the right thing to do but we've got to demonstrate to maintain talent and get best in class talent. It's 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 the domain of the people on this webinar, facilities management, but it's also the domain of human resources and HR and innovation and chief experiential officer and culture officers and all these new names we have in the C-suite. Um, so I think I think that for me is that facilities management have a seat at the C-suite table now. It's very much about HR, not just exposure, exposure um, uh, occupational exposure of the people who are doing the cleaning, which again is clearly very, very important, but the people who then live in those and work in those buildings that we're cleaning. Perfect, and I think that's that's such a critical thing to keep in mind that you have to show that you're taking these measures and and yeah. that it's visible to people in buildings so they know and can feel confident that it's healthy and safe. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing, Mark and John, that you touched on is that a lot of people might have thought that this technology is very expensive when in actuality it, it isn't always the case that it's that ex expensive. So one of my questions is what are some of the misconceptions um, that people might have when it comes to improving air quality in buildings? Oh and uh, 
Mark is the, the recent published author on this field, so I think Mark should go. <laughs> All right, Mark, go well, ahead. Well, I've, I've had the um, opportunity to talk to very different stakeholders, um, parents. Again, I'm, I'm, most of this is, is recent experience with back to school, but we've also had some back to office experience as well, light office, you know, office with cubicles where um, you know managers are kind of on the outside at low density and in the in the most of the occupied space are high density cubicles um, and we've approached them the same and it's been with um, simple monitoring um, that is we we put monitors that that report to a dashboard in real time so should the agency or business choose everybody can see what they're breathing at any time and simple stuff what are the particle loads What's the CO2, the chemicals as judged by VOC, and of course, comfort, uh, humidity and temperature. Um, and, you know, people appreciate information. Uh, it, all the stakeholders seem to, both in the schools and, and, and light office, in real time information. You get into the car, you know how much your gas tank, how, what's in your tank, you know the oil pressure, you know, you got this dashboard of information in transportation, now you've got a dashboard of information about your exposure. Some care, some don't, but across, there was always each stakeholder group, whether it be parents, teachers, administrators, and in some cases, the students themselves, certainly at the university and high school level, everybody appreciates the information. And it, it really, probably the rub is how do you interpret that? And we have guidelines coming, both from the World Health Organization and from our flagship architectural engineering societies um, that, hey, this is what's normal and this is what's not. In this season, we would see this indoors and this not. So that 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 path is coming. And um, that, you know, the education to interpret, you know, what's a normal CL2 level? What's a normal particulate matter load? I mean, we do that with outdoor air, EPA regulates that. We haven't done it with indoor air and it's coming. So I, I think it's gonna take the guesswork out of interpretation um, here pretty uh, quickly. But the common theme that I see is that the center of mass of the different stakeholder groups appreciate the information. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a, I would say a predominantly positive response, not a fear, general fear, oh my God, the air is, is dirty. But hey, you know, if I have a dashboard in a car, why don't I have a dashboard in my building? Um, and th that, that's been my, my real-time experience if i were to encapsulate it in a nutshell yeah and i would I, i'll add to that um you know we had the you know the the privilege to work with all types of facilities worldwide whether it was convention centers schools um you know uh stadiums arenas hospitality um spas and salons i mean even a doggy daycare um, it was all types of facilities worldwide, and what what was what I believe Mark, you said it that a lot of people had this perception that it's going to be way too expensive and way too hard to do. And what they don't understand is, and and I I would say even I've been a little bit surprised at some of the new technologies that are coming out in the market and some of these monitoring systems that are now available that you can go purchase on off the shelf. And you can actually see what how what the quality of your air is. What Mark is indicating as far as what's coming from WHO and some of these architectural firms is really something that we've waited for for a long time. What does it mean to have healthy air inside in that built environment? And there will be a challenge because we may have to, I mean, I think everybody felt that, oh my goodness, you know, energy costs are gonna go up. We're gonna have to, you know, ratchet up all of our HVAC systems, which you might, but you might not. And it and it really comes down to, we need to have better monitoring systems in our, in our buildings, be able to then have that interpretation and that interpretation is gonna be coming. And, you know, and looking at those dashboards and being able to have better environments for, um you know our our ability to live and breathe john yep john 
<laughs> yeah, again, I, I, I mean, if we if we go back to the question you asked about when did this whole area come under scrutiny? The, the first go round a lot of this was driven by energy efficiency back in the 70s of the first oil crisis. And we're in, a, we're in an energy crisis now again. And, and we tightened all our buildings for energy efficiency. And there's always a trifecta, there's always kind of three things you need to look in a building that if you're trying to chase kind of energy goals and you tamper with energy efficiency, you need to look at material science. So that's the products we put in, outgassing from furniture, incidental furniture, floor coverings, paints, but also that would then include how we clean, how we clean the buildings and how we maintain them. And then, <clears throat> and then air quality. So if you kind of, if you manipulate any of those three things for building, you're connected to something else. So we got it wrong in the first energy crisis where we just tightened all these buildings up and then people got sick and unwell, building related illness due to VOCs. Um, now we're doing that all again and we have smart buildings we have energy efficient buildings and sustainable and we've we've had lead and us green building we've had all those but that's been very much targeted at being planet friendly and when we spoke about esg we talked, really the e wasn't environment it was energy and it was carbon yeah. and it was yes. energy efficiency um but now we're looking at truly build what i think we've all used expressions kind of concept of one health a healthy planet and healthy people living on a healthy planet so we we will need to pursue energy audits and energy efficiency goals and now we're looking at air quality goals but ultimately what we're really after is healthy people to live in healthy indoor environments the built environment and what is healthy and as paddy and marcus says we're now beginning to get guidelines on those um, and the fact that you can measure, as Marcus says, and employees aren't going to stand for what we just don't know. Back, you know, maybe five years ago when we were all talking about this message, um, it wasn't really seen as a HR issue. It was, well, let's not find out what the air quality is in our business because they'll all be going to HR and there will be a problem. Now people say, well, we want to know. And you need you, you can't hide from this anymore. This is this is a basic. Even the United Nations talk about breathing healthy air being a human a human right. So um, you need to get with this agenda. You not only need to design your buildings in in a way. And we've seen pandemics, whether it was tuberculosis and various other Spanish flu, actual architecture changing high levels of windows in schools in the 1950s and things like that. Um, how we design our buildings, then how we construct our buildings, and then for the people on the call today, how we maintain and clean and manage and ventilate those buildings is very much front and center going forward. But it, I, I think that there's a fallacy that these are mutually exclusive and they're not. And what we haven't done is monitor them and you can't manage what you don't measure. And if we can measure this affordably in real time, we can balance energy with occupant satisfaction with true air quality if we have the information yeah. and it's it's cheap and easy to get that information now granted there's some junk right i mean the, the commercial space there's you know there's some poor lower quality monitors just like any other thing and there's some high quality monitors but the high quality stuff is still affordable so yeah. I, I love uh, you know tracy uh anger at epa uh nailed me on that and and kept saying hey what you're saying is you can't manage what you don't measure and we can measure now so yeah. let's let's measure energy consumption let's mm. measure our quality and get the balance in mm. a range that occupants are satisfied and it's not going to be off the chart expensive i think that that was the fear um, well, if you just, just on that point i think to prof allen uh, paddy i know he's a he's well known to you he just said you just run the simple mathematics so energy efficiency of a building maybe 10 percent of your overhead um, and if you can do an energy or tighten everything up and seal it all up you may save 20 percent off your energy bills there's 20 percent off 10 so that's two percent of your overhead your overhead of a business your human resources or your people the most important asset you spend all this money to recruit maintain and retain they're normally 50 percent of your overhead so if you've chased that two percent and then now all your team are actually operating 10 20 percent below they're all falling asleep with carbon monoxide and particulates becoming unwell let's do the math as mark is saying you can measure everything so if you're chasing energy points over here but your hr points have been massively impacted and we can do that work it just doesn't make sense so it is absolutely right they're all connected mm -hmm. and it's so interesting how technology has given us so many more opportunities than we had at the previous energy crisis and now we can um, really make some 
a big impacts and big changes. So one thing I really wanted to ask you is, I know we've talked about monitors throughout this presentation, but you know, including monitors, what technology is available to really help support safe and effective cleaning in commercial spaces? And you know, how popular have these technologies really become in commercial buildings? Uh, Patty, would you mind starting? <laughs> Sure. Um, you know, I think that we're seeing, oh, there's so many of them. And if I, you know, probably I'm going to get in trouble for not mentioning um, one or something. But, you know, I think that we're seeing some of the new microfiber towels that are coming um, on the market. They are really technology wise um, a, an item that reduces water consumption. It even reduces some, you know, of the consumption for the chemistries that we need to use for cleaning and disinfecting. We're seeing some of the new air treatment, I'll say, like the the portable. Sometimes you can't change the HVAC very easily within a building. Think about some of the older schools that have radiators in them or something of like that, and, and they may not have the ability to change that. Some of the older buildings within Europe, um, I was brought that was brought to my attention this morning, but they can put in portable units in those areas and we're starting to see some of these new technologies and again where they used to be very pricey the prices are really coming down um and as market indicated we're seeing some things that are not as um that are really great and then some things you know you're always going to have to you know find you know to to research it a little bit um, John and his group does a lot with allergy standards and um, they do a lot of certification on that. We have the Registered Technologies and Programs program. Uh, well has works with Well. Um, there are programs that are out there now that are starting to look at what are these products and how do they actually apply. And um, that to me is very exciting. And I think that we really need to pay attention to those new products and technologies that are starting to come on, on board. Perfect. And John, do you have anything to add? Yes, I'd add on to, to Patty's um, points about third party verification programs. And again, I'd certainly endorse Patty's GVAC star and her registered products because it's evidence-based and it's, it's fact-based and I, I recently spoke at the BOMA conference the building owners and managers association um, and they're really worried they treat their buildings as assets and they talk about the buildings become stranded assets because they're not up to speed on ESG um, and all the research there shows that if you're going to put in a wellness program a hygiene program all the aspects we should be doing for buildings make sure it's part of the many third-party verification program. So all your efforts are bundled about that communication we spoke at the beginning. You can show your employees you're doing it, show your investors, show your school board, show your various stakeholders. And there's Well Buildings, the International Well Building Institute, there's GRESB in Europe. There's many, there's many of these and we've put some in the resource material. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna kind of dodge the question by, I'm not gonna go for any particular technology, but I would say make sure that the claims are, because there's a lot of stuff out there that is being verified by a third party, the claims stack up. And then kind of to, to kind of steal some of Mark's points is then measure, measure, because no point in investing all this stuff, you can't prove the outcomes and we're having impact. So there are many, many technologies out there, it can be difficult to navigate, but help use other people to help you navigate by their verification program. And then when you put them into your building, make sure, as Mark says, we're measuring um, and monitoring and what we're actually investing in is having an impact. And Mark, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I'm, I, I can say just even the short, you know, in the pandemic era, you know, so let's say the last three years, um, there is tremendous positive competition in the monitoring space. It's, you know, that like our, you know, like our, computation you know buying a computer is getting better cheaper faster every year we see that with monitoring and there's met you know there's a bunch of companies they're no longer startups you know um, they've made it they're selling good instrumentation to install um, again I'm not going to measure names but I, you know I've, I've tested like six different monitors for different school districts in our state in the last couple of years um, and you know th there's there's really good affordable stuff coming as is the support to install one. I just did an install in a classroom, it took me 20 minutes from the time I put the monitor in, 
near the return error till the time I could see that data on the dashboard. Battery operated, few hundred dollars, relatively high quality equipment. Um, you know, so I, the era of Fitbit for buildings is coming, and it's <laughs> literally, you know, it's 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 exciting and affordable. So I, I think we're going to see good, healthy competition in the space for monitoring not only air quality but the cleanliness of de desktops, as well as building hygiene. You know, who's who's actually there's competition to clean the ducts and the heat transfer equipment and all that. Good, healthy competition that's going to bring prices down and quality up. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and there's no doubt in my mind the COVID era catalyzed this. Yeah, made a big, big impact. Um, moving on. So, a lot of what we've been talking about is, you know, you can't measure, you can't manage what isn't being measured. Um, and that it's super important to have these technologies in place um, just to be able to see them. Um, but what are some approaches that you'd recommend for reducing uh, pathogen transmission facility-wide? So if a facility manager sees when they're measuring that, okay, our air quality isn't so great, um, you know, what are some steps that they can take to, you know, with cleaning in particular as the focus um, to address it? And then, well, okay. I'll start. <laughs> you want to take it, Patty? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> You know, the lessons that we learned through COVID are really important to remember. I mean, first of all, you know, if you're not feeling well, stay home. Um, it's one of those things. And I know that that's an easy thing to say and sometimes not easy to do. Um, you know, use masks when appropriate. Um, as far as if you feel you're ill or if you're immunocompromised and it's flu season and you're, you're going to be going into a very um, crowded area. When you're measuring and monitoring and you're seeing that the CO2 levels or the, the particulate levels are going up and you can adjust your HVAC to, to help mitigate that, do it. Um, if you can't, bring in portable units. Um, make sure that hand hygiene is available from an infection prevention standpoint, whether it is you know your hand washing areas in the bathrooms or air, others, and then hand sanitizer. Um, I guess I'm a little dismayed when I'm going into a lot of, you know, whether it's hotels or airports, we're starting to either not see them or not see them maintained. And that's really disconcerting right now because it's one of our, you know, we don't think about it. We're always touching our eyes and touching our nose and, and little kids are putting their fingers in our mouth, their mouths. And it's one of those things that, you know, even if it's airborne, if someone had just accidentally sneezed or something, there is a percentage that is transmitted via fomite or via surfaces. And then in, from a facility maintenance standpoint, also pay attention to your, make sure that your staff is trained. You know, you can give them all of these new widgets and you can give them all of the new tools and technologies, but if you don't train people on how to use them, and as Mark and, and John had indicated earlier, it doesn't take that much to train them um you know to how to use the equipment right when they see something that's not working right to bring it to your attention as a manager and um so that they do it correctly because when we do it correctly we have better results and better efficiencies and effectiveness so those are just some of the things um that we can do to keep things moving forward and again what we're trying to do is build resilience because we will have another pandemic we will have another flu season and people are going to get sick and so you know we want to be prepared for that of course and uh, mark do you have anything to add i mean I, I think patty outlined you know this is a layered approach and it takes participation from everybody that's going to come into the building the occupants the building managers and so on let's you know we need some uh societal discipline if you're sick, if you're symptomatic, don't come to work or school. Just don't. Easier said than done, right? And I've, I've really seen this um, in schools that parents can't anticipate when a child's going to be sick, and they got to go to work, right? Especially when there's two working parents. And we see, you know, most families, uh, family leadership is everybody's working. So, you know, surprise, I got a fever this morning. Um, you know, it, it's it's societal discipline and, and flexibility. Um, in in the workforce, being able to stay home when you're sick, number one, um, 
choosing layers of protection patty made brought them at you know hands and face hands and masks they have to be available right so the hand goo's got to work and it's got to be there masks have to be available if if we don't you know why can we make them as available as hand goo that okay something's up we're, we're going to mask voluntarily of course and then all the building factors so we have this layered approach occupant participation administrative training of facilities managers and then the hard infrastructure stuff can we have the stuff uh, uh where we need it not every classroom needs an air purifier you know let's figure out the ones that do put them there deploy them make sure they're operating make sure the staff is trained to do so and again i think all this adds up if if we juxtapose worker productivity student learning absenteeism costs against the benefit of john brought this up the you know the cost of yeah mass costs hand goo costs that all costs but if you look at the balance of hey if we don't do this and we have high absenteeism rate poor worker productivity poor student learning outcomes those costs far outweigh a little bit of stuff for your hands uh masks available turning up the ventilation i mean it's just I, I think we will find and we're actually doing these measurements in denver public schools you know what's what's the return on absenteeism um from from these increased costs and i i think the projections and the data are going to show it's absenteeism and work loss of worker productivity and bad morale look i don't want to go in that building you know just not wanting to go to work affects your productivity yeah. or getting an allergic reaction or any of that stuff i think the people side and the people cost far outweighs what we're going to see increased in building management worker participation uh, and so on that's that's my guess and there's a lot of people working on that question right now and that's a lot of what i've been hearing about as well um, with facility executive and john do you have anything that you'd like to add to this uh point well so first of all agree i couldn't agree more this is what we're passionate about that's why we're on this webinar and um, there is some really interesting research about uh, where the u.s budget uh, gets spent on healthcare and we know it's going in that direction um, and what actually impacts on our health outcomes and the latest research from a group in europe called stock s-t-o-k again we can make the paper available and um, they say about 70 percent of our health outcomes are related to our environment and our behaviors in our environment the 90 percent of the healthcare budget goes on access to doctors people like me er physicians and medications and tablets and and, and those type of things treating illness after we become ill so if we know that our environment and how we behave in our environment has such a big impact or those burden costs that Mark is talking about. If a kid gets an asthma attack, an allergy attack, a parent has to take a day off work to bring them to the ER, and then they don't play football, and they, and they need to go on steroids, and suddenly everything. But if we dealt with the environment where we can, where, we, where it's possible, deal with the environmental triggers and remove those as source, that whole cascade of burden costs that we're laying on tablets and doctors and, and more visits, of course, the doctors then are very important. It's, you know, your family doctors is the cornerstone of your management. But we can do so much more with patients. So I would argue that you have doctors and react to ER doctors and surgeons at one end of a spectrum. But then as you move down that spectrum, your general, your GP, your nurse, and your physio, your occupational doctor, and then even your exercise coach and your nutritionist and your meditation and your yoga coach, all that you go all the, all the way down the spectrum around health. And I believe people who design buildings and people like Mark are in this field, they're very much as valid on that wellness spectrum and that how we design buildings, how we maintain, how we clean buildings, because we know the evidence shows that's what impacts on health outcomes. And we need to, to have the conversation like that. And the other thing I would say is that, and there is a little bit of debate over it, maybe slightly controversial, that uh, uh, Paddy spoke about, you know, vectors, Florence Nightingale, washing hands, going back to things we've done for years and years, and then fomites and then air, those things. So we're talking about cleaning to stop the vector, the transmission. But that's when we're talking about infection control. And while this talk is about air quality, so again, we've got to kind of, when are we talking about just healthy buildings, as it were, and cleaning just for general air quality? And then when are we cleaning because it's infection control? And they're not quite the same thing, but, so, but we do need to do, we do, people on this call need to know how to do both, how to respond and manage infection control outbreaks, but also then how do we do ongoing air quality and cleaning for air quality.
very important, very important stuff. Um, and thank you guys so much for um, taking some time to answer these questions. Um, I do have one more just before we move ahead to the Q&A section, but if you could give advice to the facility executives and facility managers on this call about maybe one simple small step that they could take um, even today to make their building and their air quality, you know, even 1% better, um, you know, what advice might you have? Monitor, <laughs> uh, measure and monitor. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's one piece. The other thing is invest in your people, make sure that they're trained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then John, what about you? Do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I was waiting for pausing for, for Mark, because Mark actually, the, the last symposium that he was one of the keynote speakers at, he actually built in front of our very eyes with a battery and a few things, and he and he made a, 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 a sensor right there for the whole audience. He showed us how you could do it. Um, so I'd probably, well, I'll hand over to Mark, but for me, it's not an easy thing, but it's that shift, is change, realize now, um, I often say that we still, to this very day, say bless you when people sneeze, and that's that thing over from the bubonic plague in London hundreds of years ago, because it started with the respiratory infection, so if you're sneezing, you're already on this pathway to this horrible death, so still to this day, hundreds of years later, we still say that, so the pandemic and the shifts in behavior and culture, they're not going backwards. So what we're, what we're left with is the new reality. So come to webinars like this, get educated uh, and realize this is really, really important. But for kind of practical stuff, what you can actually do, I think maybe I'll, I'll hand over to Mark for that. Now, Patty used it, it's the M word, monitor, monitor, monitor. And I think <laughs> we'll all be surprised that, you know, a lot of the buildings are really well performing, right? Mm -hmm really well performing um I, we had one we were sure this was going to be a, a sour school building 100 years old uh university hill elementary beautiful old classic design all based on natural ventilation and it was dynamite absolutely fantastic you know so i i think we'll be surprised at how you know a good number of buildings are really high performing regardless of their age um and we need to you know bring the ones that aren't up to speed uh, affordably, but it, it all starts with the M word. Monitor, monitor, monitor. I agree. And I'm an educator, so of course, <laughs> let's get educated, right? The people that are operating our buildings, um, you know, let, let's, and it's, it's not a steep learning curve and it's kind of cool, right? Again, I, I don't want to geek out on everybody about, oh yeah, you know, particulate matter and VOCs and all this, but I think we'll get used to what's normal if we just take a look. What's a normal day in a normal building during normal occupation levels? And let, let's get used to what's normal and saying saying something when it's not. Yeah. So that, I, that's what it's about. I think one thing that you know we've alluded to, I mean, the three of us on this call can get really geeked out on all this because I mean that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the things that I guess, you know, from raising two sons and and being involved in school systems throughout and and actually providing environmental health and safety support you know from you know frontline workers all the way up to physicians and doctors and phd scientists and that kind of thing um all my career is don't be afraid of the science and don't be afraid to ask questions and because people, you know, hear that science word and they all of a sudden will go, oh, God, it's going to be too good, difficult, you know, and they remember the algebra class in high school and it's like, you know, or the, science, the chemistry class and they just get really scared and it's not that difficult and it can actually be a lot of fun and, um, and we can have a lot of fun with it. And um, sometimes we as scientists have to remember that, you know, okay, you know, let's show contamination instead of going off on all of these tangents, you know, get a UV light and some, you know, glow germ and show how you take gloves off, for example. That's how we trained the people in the Ebola unit at Emory University is we actually put glow germ on their hands or on their gloves and made them take them off. And, and you know, it really can be a lot of fun um, to learn. Absolutely. Well, this presentation has been a lot of fun. I feel like I've gotten some great perspective. Thank you, John, Patty, and Mark um, for speaking with me. I think we're about ready to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So, and thank you to our audience for submitting any questions. Okay, I will take a quick look. Let's see. Um, 
So to start out, we have one person asking, um, I think for, for you, Patty, as we improve um, IAQ for people, how does this effort affect energy and sustainability for buildings? You know, I don't think they have to be exclusive. I think that we have to take a step back and look at what is the goal. I mean, obviously we want to reduce energy consumption and from a sustainability standpoint, but we've got to also be very cognizant of the health of the people in the building. And um, and if, if, if the groups, <laughs> having managed and worked in those both of those worlds, um, if the groups can sit down and talk to each other and have a common goal, it is doable. But sometimes, you know, each, you know, you have to give a little bit on some things and maybe you are going to have to increase the energy a little bit to have a healthy building. But I don't believe that they're, in, you know, exclusive from one another. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, let me take a look. Oh, it looks like we have another question here. Um, I think this is for you, John. Um, what is the relevance of sensor technology and smart buildings for facility managers? Well, I think I think we've kind of covered that covered that a lot, and it's kind of related even to the last question. That if you, building owners, um, I mentioned about ESG metrics. I mean, and that is really something that every, every rating agency now. It's almost something. There's a financial metric to it, and it'll turn up on your balance sheet, like your your P&L, your cash flow, um, and you you'll have an ESG rating on it. So if if your goal is just to pursue energy efficiency. But then you're going to you're not going to do well on your ESG points with regards to society and and access and and all the other things, uh, comfort, physiology, good place to work. So they're all connected. And Mark said this earlier that you can't just talk about energy in isolation or carbon in isolation anymore. You've got to look at the building as an integrated building management system, HR related to facilities management related to ESG related to energy audit related to your CFO. So it, it's, a, it's across the board and even if you think of one of the easiest ways of getting uh, lead credits is looking at how you're cleaning a building and uh, using green or sustainable um, chemistry in how you're cleaning buildings will, will, will actually give you direct lead credits. Um, and I think the sensor technology is is what we said. The first iteration, and I really like Mark's point about um, it being Fitbit for buildings, and then is the is the monitor is that like Facebook for buildings, seeing all the all the dashboards and how where's your building been hanging out type of stuff. But that idea that we can now measure everything that can be measured will have a monitor. Every monitor will be connected, and every every connected monitor will be smart and feeding into something else and being measured. So I think the first iteration of, of efficient buildings, say at homes, we had toasters talking to fridges and all this kind of stuff. That was being it was being efficient and energy efficient, getting stuff done. Now we want to know are they healthy? So energy order and energy sensor technology, heat recovery systems, ventilation, they're all connected. But I think the ultimate outcome we're really all about is well, what is the definition of a building, the built environment? It's, it's a place of safety and a place where we can actually go and work and thrive and do well. So smart buildings must be for about the people who live in those buildings, whether in schools or they're working or whatever they're doing in those buildings. I think the smart connected building with sensor technology in the future will be about one health, healthy planet, but healthy people. Yeah, absolutely. And even when we talk about, you know, building monitor technology, the thought that, you know, facility managers and executives can manage their buildings even when they're not physically there. Yes. So they can like just have it just on their on their phone or so if something happens while they're away, having that ability is is pretty critical, I think. Yeah, I mean I, I was at a was at a um, the International Builder Show and LG were doing a big thing about the smart home and uh, the story was that the freezer got opened and one of the dogs, squeezy toys, rolled under and it trapped the freezer door open. And they were away on holiday, but they got a, a notification on, on their phone that there was something wrong, the freezer door was going down, they was ring one of the kids, the dog's toy was trapped, keeping the freezer door open. So that's just a silly story about the freezer not wasting all your food and everything. But going forward about what's going on in that building is there too many people in that room for the air exchange are they doing different activities is it sports or, or or what's happening somebody cleaning so vocs have just gone up and the fact that it can be done remotely and um, i think just adds a whole layer to it so yes yeah, smart smart buildings and remote monitoring is going to be the way forward yeah perfect um we have another question here um how do you know what um 
IAQ monitor to trust? There are so many options at different price points. How do we make the right purchase decision? That's a that's a great question. And I've you know, for instance, um, I just bought 3,000 monitors for Colorado Public Schools. So, as with anything, buyer beware. Um, you know, uh, you know, Consumer Reports will get into this game. Uh, just the competition is gonna is gonna cause you know sifting of uh, junk from high quality stuff. You know, that one thing you gotta love about capitalism when competition's there, it works. And um, you know the high quality stuff will separate from the low quality stuff uh, here in short order. I think with the investments that we're seeing in them, but it, it does come back to buyer beware. Really, you know, no matter what you buy, do your homework because um, I, I there is junk out there and there's good stuff and everything in between. Um, and you know what what I have found also is in, I'm working with very many small businesses out here. And the small businesses have found that when we monitor, it's good for business. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. when we advertise that we're monitoring, I get more patrons in my restaurant. I get more people in my workout studio and gym, um, mm -hmm. just simply because as an owner, I have, I acknowledge it's an investment and it hits my bottom line, but the payback has been on the upside. It was probably Mike Freed at, at Post Ranch Inn in California working with the California Re Restaurant Association when they were shut down, right? We weren't going to restaurants in California. They said, we're going to monitor. We're going to put in a, an abatement system. We're going to show it works. During occupation, will you let us have patrons? And they did. And um, that I, I think that was one of the pioneering um, uh, uses of monitoring in small business, right? The solo restaurant out in the coast of California, that said, we're going to do something about it. We have engineering controls to lower exposure. We're going to use monitors to show they work. Come back and eat. You know, and we've seen it here in Boulder. It's a fitness mecca. We've seen it in gyms, Pilates studios, cafes. Um, engineering controls are being put in, mostly satellite air purifiers like the schools. But by putting a monitor in, showing it work, it's working. It's encouraged people to come back and they trust it. So, it, you know, <laughs> Good cleaning, good good quality management of your building, at least for some small businesses, is a good investment. And it, it, there is a buyer beware, but I think it pays back quickly. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we have some another question. One gentleman is asking, is there training I can do to learn more of how I can clean for air quality? John, you're all set up for this one. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Neil, I believe now my trusty uh, helper Neil will be able to put up some slides for us. So you, you did ask Jen if we could if there were further resources, and I know um, yes. and <laughs> have put in a, a handout. But I, I just, just probably go on to this. Mark is absolutely right. This in science called the observer effect or the effect of observation. We know when we audit things, just the very fact of measuring and observing something, the phenomena gets improved just by observing it. So that, that effect is, is going to be um, table stakes for facilities management. It'd be no long to say, well, we don't really know what we're doing or is it working? You, you need to monitor. So, um, so, so, so uh, during the pandemic uh, and afterwards, there's some uh, talks I've given with Patty and as, as we marked at a conference, we, we actually got a lot of feedback from facilities managers like where can we get more resources. So we've designed an online uh, educational program. It's self-paced learning at your own time. You do it on your iPad, on your, on your, on your phone. There's some MTQs. It's fully accredited. So via various um, organizations like today's webinar, you can get your professional, uh, continuing professional development points. Um, and there's a welcome video by, by Paddy, she, she'll bring you through exactly what it's about, the learning goals, and then I do some of the um, the kind of academic or the science part, parts of it. So if you go to the next slide, Neil, um, these are the type of things that, that, we'll, that, that you'll get out of if you do a course like this. We look at some of the science of it, some of those burden costs, the impacts of costs uh, on, on health and, and, and lack of health and, and wellness. We talk about indoor triggers. We say, well, what, what's, what's uh, Mark mentioned about fomite? What is a fomite? And what does airborne transition mean to actually particulate, a particle transmission? Or, is it, or, or what's formaldehyde? What's an allergen? What's an irritant? 
what does that mean to you? It's very much the why is it important, and then we talk a little bit about how to clean as well. Now we know uh, in buildings are integrated and material science impacts on chemistry, which impacts on airflow, etc. So that, that's the other type of things we'll cover, and there's a specific module on what the coronavirus is and how is coronavirus related to, to various illnesses and what is a normal flu compared to coronavirus and how is it different. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, if you go to the easy way to get to it, and we, we'll, we, we'll send this all around to everybody if they're interested. So you just go to allergystandards.academy, and right there on the landing page, that you'll see the GBAC logo and the ISA logo. And if you click on that link, you'll come through to the next slide, um, where we have for today, there's a QR code. You can go right ahead and scan that QR code for your phone now if you want, but we'll let these around. And, and because you're all readers of your publication and attendees. We've, we've got a, a pretty significant discount for today. So when you log into the page, there's a coupon code there. And I said, we'll circulate these slides if people are interested. Um, but that's just a really easy, there's four modules, self-paced. Each module is about 15 minutes long. Um, and you can go at your own time and do MCQs and then upload at the end. And you'll get a certificate of, of competence around what is healthy buildings, but by ISSA and GBAC. Yeah. Thank you, and, and it was great working with John on this. Um, the other thing is that we are having our GBAC experience this summer, and um, in the handouts there is um, just the, the, the first round of our, our preliminary agenda and what it's all about. Um, Mark will be there, I will be there. We're trying to convince John to come across the pond. He's actually in Dublin, Ireland. Um, but it's going to be focusing on the two, really the things that we've been talking about today indoor air quality what we're seeing in the event in the industry as well as monitoring and measuring of how we define clean and it is going to be very experiential meaning that you know you're going to have the opportunity to go into even mock rooms you know like a mock OR room or a mock hotel room or classroom or you know a mock cafe Starbucks um, actually it's a mock Starbucks um, that is really kind of a unique um, experience and again for that learning and opportunity and collaboration um, that you know we've all been missing here in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to dig in, you can take an air quality <laughs> class at your local university. That's true. <laughs> a lot of more online now. So, sorry, I had to just give a plug for the education sector. <laughs> oh, of course. And thank you for sharing that with our audience. That's awesome. Um, I think we have time for one last final question um, for whomever would like it. Um, air quality is invisible, so many people are unaware and don't notice it when it gets better or worse. Um, how can we get more people to care and seek out solutions to improve air quality? I, I gotta share a personal experience here, you know. So as we, through GEC Registered, are working with a lot of um, monitors and technology, and I know that Mark has put some in his home, I'm sure John has some in his home, I put one in my home. And you know, thinking again that it's invisible, everything's fine, right? Um, I have an older home that we just moved in about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And when I put that monitor in, I was stunned. I was actually stunned about the VOC levels. And, and you know, and I do have dogs, but I had really old carpet. And what I am finding is the need to be able to then myself mitigate what, you know, going down through that, that whole thought process of, I need to do something better here. I've got to come. I, that science part of me, the industrial hygiene part of me is sitting there going, I got to find the answer to this. Um, but you're absolutely right. People need to care about this. And that residual headache that you have or when you wake up with the stuffy nose in the morning, it's these allergens and in, in maybe VOCs or maybe CO2 levels that you're experiencing these now you know, closed environments are things that we do need to pay attention to for our overall productivity and health. Yeah, just, so just literally here it is on my desk. I don't just I'm sure you with this mark. Very low cost carbon, just a carbon dioxide monitor, which is a proxy for you know, very loose proxy for, for airflow or air exchange. But I you can see here now a simple traffic light. I know you we need to be careful with traffic lights, Mark. I know it's a, a bugbear of yours, but um I've closed all the windows here because I didn't want any noise from outside for the webinar, and I've turned off all the air ventilation, everything I've I'm on shutdown and I've been sitting here for nearly an hour in, in my office. 
and it's gone to medium now on carbon dioxide. So I mean, that's just just the simple feedback loops. So and now, you know, would you open up windows, get some fresh air, get up, walk around, just be healthy? It's what we should be doing anyway. I mean, that's a, a few. I'm sure you're familiar with those, Mark. Few few dollars CO2 monitor just to change behaviours. That's what we want. Little psychological prompts to change behaviours. I'm, I'm noticing the number on there, John. Time to open the window. I know. That's what I said. I've been on. I've been on shutdown because I didn't want any noise or anything. So I've been <laughs> I, I, I think the take-home message of that question is: try it. You'll like it. Um, it it isn't free, but you know, you give up a couple of coffees a week. Next thing you know, it you can buy a monitor. It's it's within reach for for working people. Well, thank you. It looks like we're out of time, everyone. Thank you, Patty, Mark, and John for speaking with us today about cleaning for air quality. And thank you to ISSA for sponsoring this webinar. Um, and thank you to all attendees for coming in and for sending in questions. Um, if we weren't able to address your questions today, we'd be happy to address it later offline. Um, thank you again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs> this presentation will be available on facilityexecutive.com as well. <laughs> Have a great oh, day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.